The following program on WBBZ-TV was produced in partnership with the Community Health Center of Buffalo, your partner for quality care, who paid a production fee for this presentation. The Community Health Center of Buffalo presents Community Health Center Buzz. Now from the Community Center, please welcome Carla Thomas and her special guests. This morning, we are blessed to have with us uh, the Honorable Dr. LaVon Ansari, who is the CEO of this esteemed establishment, and Dr. Kenyani Davis, who is our Chief Medical Officer. How are you this morning, ladies? We are excellent, excellent. Good, Glad good. to be here. We're so happy to have you. Um, for this next couple of minutes, what we're going to do, we're going to talk about what's going on in the community with the vaccines, we're going to talk about some of the issues surrounding the community resistance to the vaccines, and we're just going to get right into it. How about that? Fair enough. All right. You, Dr. I'm sorry, I'm going to start with you first. What do you see as the root cause of the resistance to being vaccinated in communities of color? The root cause the is root really cause. more than 200 years of oppression. Yes. of not trusting our systems and the social injustice that we currently are in from housing, transportation, mm -hmm. food deserts, and, and now we talk about health care. So when you put all of that together mm -hmm. of hundreds of years, it's, it's an accommodation. It's a culmination of a lot of things. Yes. So it's not just we're not taking the vaccine. It's from systemic reasons for not and our hesitancy of taking um, not taking the vaccine. Yes. So if we're going to deal with the root cause, we have to deal with the root cause, which is years and years and years of oppression and injustices. And so with that comes the distrust. So now that you need the community that has been um, communities, of, particularly communities of color, that you, that you want them to trust the system it has a history of not trusting. Absolutely. So we have to spend a whole lot of time educating our communities mm -hmm. as to the importance of the vaccinations by while simultaneously addressing the institutional racism that exists in all the systems. Absolutely. Well, you broke that down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Davis, how about you? What do you see as the root cause of the vaccination resistance in communities, especially communities of color. Yeah, I think there's, like Dr. Ansari eloquently put it, right? Yes, yes. Uh, there's multi layers to mm -hmm. it. I do want to say that I think it is almost premature to say that uh, communities of color had hesitancy because I don't know if we had the full access mm -hmm. like other places had. Right. Um, so I think that's the first part to kind of highlight. But we, we're all getting into this resistant, this resistant group. But when you talk about healthcare disparities or underserved communities, mm -hmm. mistrust is a huge thing. Yes. And you have to be able to get over that hurdle before you start to talk about the facts. And I, I think we jumped over, we brushed over that that part of the mistrust. You have to connect with the community, and you have to get over, identify that mistrust, mm -hmm. get over that, and then start talking about the facts. Yeah, at first, um, it was an issue of almost feeling like. Um, you were being denied access right. because it didn't appear to be readily available. And then all of a sudden there's a push to take it. Um, I think that probably had a lot to do with um, there was hanging fruit and now there's not. Right. There were the people that um, understood um, the danger of not being vaccinated and then there were those who just were adamant about it. Yeah, so things like that subconsciously push people backwards, right? Mm -hmm. You're ready, you're ready, you anticipate it, you get ready, you can't get it, and then all of a sudden it's like, no, 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 now you can have it. Mm -hmm. So those, some of those things um, perpetuate some of those stereotypes in the communities. They're not intentional per se, but that's why when you're working with communities of color, underserved communities, I, you know, I tell the people that I'm clinically training, you have to be very intentional yes. in what it is that you do. Intentional in, in how you say things, intentional how you walk in a room, intentional mm -hmm. about your tone for that particular reason. Because some of these unspoken things, things mm -hmm. that you probably didn't intend for things to mean, have a very different meaning when people already have mistrust in well, the community. There's a feeling in the community, some think that the lack of access was intentional. Do you think it was intentional or do you think it was collateral damage? I think that 
from a from a global perspective and then when you break it down into just communities mm-hmm. and it, there was never a plan mm-hmm. when this pandemic hit the world none of us had a plan mm-hmm. so not having a plan and then you have technology that actually people are now on Facebook and they're getting information from all these different sources that yes. are not accurate mm-hmm. so no plan and then our own CDC, we're all working through it in real time. Mm-hmm. All three of those mm-hmm. issues mm-hmm. Gave, the, gave the whole world, uh, we don't know what's going on. Right. So the other thing is, because this is something that the human being hasn't seen in 102 years, we weren't prepared for the masses of information that needed to be distributed to be able to articulate it to communities of all over the world that have different cultures, different languages. Yes. But the human body is reacting the same way mm-hmm. all, <laughs> because we're human. So every, no matter what language you come from, mm-hmm. what, no matter what, what um, country you're in, mm-hmm. Whatever part of the world, this disease is functioning the same way in the human body. Getting sick and dying. There you go. So if any lessons are learned, Mm -hmm. the opportunity for us to make sure that people get the right information and trusted information is a very critical piece because the information is what saved people's lives because that's how they determine whether they take the vaccine or not. Or not. New York State has endured tremendous loss throughout this pandemic, even with vaccines available. Black and brown communities continue to be hit the hardest. The Community Health Center of Buffalo wants you to visit our Buffalo and Niagara Falls sites for COVID-19 testing and vaccinations. Getting our families and our community past this pandemic starts with you. So don't hesitate. Vaccinate. Call 986-9199 for more information. What challenges, uh, Dr. Davis, did um, your leadership as the chief medical officer have to overcome when the virus started hitting uh, the communities? You had to overcome a lot of different layers all at once. It wasn't a linear, it wasn't a linear thing. You had to calm your staff down. You had to create plans for your staff to make sure that they were safe because mm-hmm. they're a part of the community too. Right. At the same time, you had your allegiance to your own patients, but you also didn't know what you were doing either, mm-hmm. right? Yes. So you, there were there were no treatments in the peer-reviewed articles. There were no how to diagnose it and how to treat it. You were still fighting the political front for testing for the community as well. So you were doing everything at one time Mm -hmm. and you really couldn't prioritize one is more important than the other. I think usually you're able to triage certain situations. You couldn't triage it. Everything was priority number one. And when everything's priority number one, it starts to pile on you. And then you have to figure out this little thing called self-care to make sure that you don't break, (laughs) you don't break down and succumb (laughs) to it. Right. Yes. Um, So I think that was the biggest challenge. And then what happened is as the pandemic continued to go on for a really long time, Mm -hmm. everything still became a priority and it lasted a really long time. And then it just kept throwing new things in there, right? So there were new guidelines that changed every hour. Then then you threw mistrust in there. So you were fighting everything at one time. The, The other part to that is that You have to remember the average person never sees how a drug gets to market. Right. Everything we're doing now is experimental. Mm -hmm. All the vaccines is experimental. So the average person doesn't see all the nuances Mm -hmm. that go. So we're actually looking at it in real time. Mm -hmm. You know, so when they stopped, when they, when they stopped the Johnson and Johnson, People are like, oh, oh. So it set us back again because that's what normally happens in the process of a drug getting to getting to the market through the FDA. Wow. But because we never see, the, the masses of the people never see the process, mm-hmm. those stops and starts become very real in practice for us. Mm-hmm. Dr. Davis, let's talk about the three current vaccines. What's the difference? 
Yeah, so there's currently three vaccines that are approved for use for emergency use authorization here in the U.S. There's actually different ones, but here in the U.S., there's mm -hmm. Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson. Pfizer and Moderna are the two that looks the most similar. It's mm -hmm. actually a newer technology, even though I hate using that word because we have been using that technology for 10 years. We mm -hmm. just needed to couple it with a vaccine. Um, that's a messenger RNA vaccine. Mm -hmm. And what that means is just a different way that the body sees the actual uh, protein so that we can make antibodies to, to it. The Johnson & Johnson is a more traditional way in how we usually use, uh, make vaccines and mm -hmm. how your body usually sees it. That's a one-dose uh, series. So those are the most basic differences between the, the three vaccines. Now, a lot of people won't know what M R M N A yeah. stands for. What does that stand for? Yeah, so in the medical community, we like to put all these acronyms together that makes it sound really smart. Mm -hmm. um, but when we talk <laughs> about messenger RNA, it's how our body creates proteins. It goes DNA to RNA to protein. And that protein is what we, quote unquote, make antibodies, antibodies too. Mm -hmm. So basically for those two, for those two vaccines, we kind of mm -hmm. enter that pathway right in the middle. And mm -hmm. then our body starts to make those proteins. And then eventually it says, oh, hold on, that's not mine. And then it starts to create antibodies to it. So it's a different way of creating a vaccine. And it doesn't incorporate into your DNA. Mm -hmm. It doesn't alter your DNA. It okay. doesn't do any of that stuff that I hear that, okay. you know, that, that contributes to people's hesitancy. It's not that type of um, not that type of vaccine. And it can't give you coronavirus because it doesn't have all of the proteins to do so. So neither one of them can do that. Now, you just answered a lot a of lot. questions. <laughs> now, the... the the acronym RMNA, what does it stand for? Um, messenger RNA. Mm -hmm. It's a very long, <laughs> RNA is, is a it, very it is. ribonucleic acid. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Okay, well, there's the R, the M, and the N, and the A. Okay. Yeah, I don't think I've said that since medical school, but okay. yeah. <laughs> All right, very good. Um, Dr. Ansari, let's go to you. As a black female, a Muslim woman, and CEO of a multi site federally qualified health center. How have you used your leadership to educate patients and the community on the benefits of the vaccine um, versus the back backlash of not being vac vaccinated? That's an excellent question. I think um, first the, you have to come to grips with your own personal um, feelings about the vaccine yourself. Mm -hmm. You can't really educate anybody comfortably. Mm -hmm. You can't convince anybody comfortably. Right. You can't influence anybody unless you're comfortable. Mm. So I, I didn't take the shot until Johnson & Johnson because I knew a lot of my staff were not going to take the shot mm -hmm. unless I took the shot. That's true. Mm -hmm. So um, I waited for that particular shot to come out because it was a one dose I knew a lot of my staff wanted was comfortable with the one dose mm -hmm. so I just sort of sat back and sort of was patient until I was able to get the shot so that I can help help convince some of my other staff members to do so so not only do you have to walk the walk and talk the talk you just can't say do as I say and not as I do mm -hmm. because as a leader, people look at you in ways that you don't see yourself. True. So you have to be more conscious that you, whether you want to be the leader or not, mm -hmm. people look at you and have a certain expectation of what a leader should be doing. Right. Right. And, you know, a lot of employees were, they became much more comfortable with the shot and getting it after you took it. Yeah, I got my dad to come up here after, from New York. Mm -hmm. um, he took the shot. He's 84 years old. Mm -hmm. Dr. Davis gave him the shot. Yeah. Um, and he wasn't going to take He just stayed locked up down in New York City. <laughs> so I'm just saying that, you know, you don't know how much influence you have on people 
when you sit in these seats that you know are leadership positions. New York State has endured tremendous loss throughout this pandemic. Even with vaccines available, black and brown communities continue to be hit the hardest. The Community Health Center of Buffalo wants you to visit our Buffalo and Niagara Falls sites for COVID-19 testing and vaccinations. Getting our families and our community past this pandemic starts with you. So don't hesitate, vaccinate. Call 986-9199 for more information. Looking at the um, uh, negativity that is supposedly surrounding J&J, &J, mm -hmm. let's talk about that a little bit. Um, the pause, do you think that was a good thing or bad thing? Do you think it was justified? Yeah, so it's funny because I'm on the other side of it, right? I'm on the whole research scientist side. So mm -hmm. I thought it was phenomenal because what it showed me was that our system is working. Yes. We have huge systems. We hear about things like the FDA, the CDC, but you never really get a chance to see it in action. Right. And they were able to find something that occurs one in one million shots mm -hmm. in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle when you're building an infrastructure. So for me, I thought it was an amazing thing. I thought it was, a, it was a comforting thing. It showed me that the layers of the federal government of how we regulate uh, new devices, mm -hmm. medications, and vaccines, it's working. Mm -hmm. I have to step back in my clinical world and I could see how that could give other people great pause, right? Absolutely. Where, where it could shake people up. But I think that's why it's really important and as we start to have these conversations in the medical community, for us to be able to articulate what our process looks like, what the scientific process looks like is important because, like we said earlier, the general population is starting to see it in real time, mm -hmm. something you guys have never seen before. So I think that the pause, I could see how it gave great hesitancy, but the, the truth is, is that to me as a clinician and even as a parent and as a person who did receive a vaccine, it let me know that what we have here in the U.S. is working in regards to our checks and balances. Mm -hmm. So it made me more comfortable. Uh, and I got to say that this is probably the first time, and, and I've seen the process a million and one times with different things, that mm -hmm. I got to say kudos to, you know, to the FDA. They were able to pick up something one in one million. Right. There were actually, at the time of the pause, uh, seven million shots had been administered. Mm -hmm. And I think there were six people so out of seven million. So that meant six million nine hundred and ninety-four thousand didn't have a problem. A absolutely. And I think the other thing to also keep in mind is that this particular condition is a rare condition nestled in an even rarer condition. So it's not like it was something that was not that that's really common. It was a very, very rare condition. Mm -hmm. And more than anything with this pause, it allowed the medical community time to stop, pause, and catch up with how do you diagnose it swiftly, how do you treat it, because mm -hmm. the, the, the way the presentation of this rare condition is, it looks like another condition that you just treat with what we call heparin, a blood thinner. However, with this particular rare condition, you make it worse. Mm -hmm. So you cause what we call iatrogenic effects, meaning that we caused you know we caused the problem so this pause and trying to treat and it, trying to treat it right so this pause did more than just focus on these blood clots this mm -hmm. pause allowed the whole medical community the community and public health to pivot to better identify diagnose and treat very good the, the other thing the one thing it's it's changed how we actually will be practicing medicine other parts have been the other parts and you know when you look at the military they've always had telemedicine mm -hmm. but it wasn't necessarily general medicine for us now right. we are doing from you know we're never going to go back just to face to face totally we are all going to always from now on do telehealth as well which is where you need to be mm -hmm. you know we we have always worked from a grassroots perspective at the community health center mm -hmm. uh, but Use, bringing technology into the picture really is, is changing the game. Mm -hmm. And it's making us more accessible to people in the community that can't even get in. And we're also learning more about what people, how, and educating, you know, we just did a segment with our barbers. Yeah, and absolutely. And questions, yeah. just having access to people that have some knowledge mm -hmm. about what people are going through and what this disease is has been awesome. Um, and them having access gives them connectivity mm -hmm. to people that culturally can understand 
the environments that we all are coming from. Dr. Davis, um, we have been doing at the Community Health Center, you and Dr. Ansari have been doing an extraordinary job in trying to reach the community. You all have been doing Zooms, we've been doing pop-ups in the community with our mobile unit. Do you think that that um, is helping to get the word out about the importance of the vaccine? So I think it's more than just educating about the vaccine, it's about just being present um, and saying, hey, flock, you can come home now. Wow. Um, so it, it has been useful, and I think this is the way medicine is going, and this is the way it should. Mm -hmm. It should go. Um, taking it out of the brick and mortar and into the communities that, that need it and meeting them where they're at, raising that comfort level and that health literacy, and then you bring them back into the, the building. So I think this has given us a unique opportunity to be present in the right way for our community. I think so, too. Yeah. I think it also helps with what Dr. Ansari, you always talk about, which is connectivity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I think that, uh, you know, just being out, when you go out and you get your patients, you don't wait for them to come to you. Right. The other thing is that we learn a lot in the community mm -hmm. that we can't get in a 15-minute visit. <laughs> right. Um, so we get to have whole, con whole conversations about what the thinking is mm -hmm. so that we can come back to prepare as providers to go out with the, with the message because this is what we're hearing, the myths that we've heard about the vaccine itself and what they think and how they're getting their information. Mm -hmm. That's not something you get necessarily in the bricks and mortar. You have to go out to the community. And then the other thing that we're concerned about is our, own, our children, wow. right? These mm -hmm. vaccines are becoming um, the teenagers can have them now, mm -hmm. from 12 to from 12 and up, and then they're looking at in September possibly um, one of the um, um, pharmaceuticals may have it from two year olds and up. So mm -hmm. we have to stay on top of it so that we can <laughs> educate our community because the community might be hesitant with vaccinations, but our children been getting vaccinations. Like you can't go to school, so it's mm -hmm. not new. Right. What's right. new That's is that true. it's an experimental use. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, Dr. Davis, this is a tough one. Yes. Children, what about, because I, I mean, I, we're really coming up against resistance in the communities about vaccinating children. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I gotta be truthful, right? Yes. I'm a mom, I'm a physician. I'm actually a preventative medicine physician. So all vaccine things, you know, I'm a total believer in. I got the vaccine when it came out. My husband got the vaccine. My, you know, my 17 year old son got the vaccine. Mm -hmm. I have two little girls. I have a five year old and I have an eight year old. And actually my five year old actually had open heart surgery at two. I gotta tell you, as a mom in me, mm -hmm. I, I understand that hesitancy. Even I have a little pause. And this is somebody who's the first person out you know, for the mm -hmm. vaccine. They've had all the vaccines, mm -hmm. so I can see the struggle. Um, it's gonna be a tough sell. I do believe in it. My husband and I have already started those conversations, and I think that it's super important for people who have kids to start having those conversations because mm -hmm. you don't wanna be late to the party. Um, we did agree to get our girls vaccinated when it does come online. But I, I'd be lying to you if I said that my heart wouldn't be doing this, mm -hmm. you know, when they get it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's, it's important to continue to have those conversations now because it's going to be a tough one. It's going to be a tough one. Dr. Ansari? I think that it's a process. Mm -hmm. So the same way, the same process we use to get our own selves vaccinated, it's a more intense process mm -hmm. to think about your children. Yes. So if we don't accept initially right away that we want to get our children vaccinated, we should be okay with that because it takes time for us to understand it and to feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. So we want people to make the decision right away. Mm -hmm. But that's not how the, the human being functions. That's right. We function through a process right. to get to where we got to go. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be the same with our children. It's just going to be more contemplation, and we're looking at their future, not just in the moment. Mm -hmm. um, some of the colleges have already talked about mandating shots for yeah. the students in this coming fall. Um, and right now they're looking at, because only one of the three vac vaccines 
is able to administer mm -hmm. to children. How do you feel about uh, children two and up, daycare, age children, two to five, yeah. uh, getting the vaccine? Yeah, that, that's hard. So my my 17 year old son, he got his because he'll be going to college, God willing, in the fall. So I wanted to make sure that he was, you know, mm -hmm. he was protected. And the two year old and the five year old, or the two, I lied to you, the five and the eight year old, where am I at in life? The five <laughs> and the eight year old um, that I have, they're smaller, right? And mm -hmm. so, like Dr. Ansari said, it's a process, right? And you need to start that process early. Two, two is tough. Right. Mm -hmm. But I do think that it's a process and I do think that they're little humans just like us that need mm -hmm. protection as well. Um, and the more people we can get vaccinated, the closer we can get to herd immunity and the closer that we can protect those who cannot yes. get the vaccine. Yes. We're coming down to the wire, ladies. This has really been quite a session. I think we have shared some information. Um, out in the community, there's all kinds of rumors and uh, misnomers about, you know, people growing tails if they get the vaccine and um, people uh, having tracking devices put in their arms if they get the shot. Um, how do we deal with that? How do we stop it or how do we dispel those rumors? We have to just educate because if you have a cell phone, it's already tracked. No, that's right. right. So you ain't got to put it in your arm. You just carry it in your hand. That's right. That's it. So that's right. I'm just saying. So a cell phone tracks everything. Yes, it does. So where you go, mm -hmm. what yeah. you look at, mm -hmm. absolutely. So we already, a society, is being tracked. Mm. So dispelling some of those myths mm -hmm. um, is critical, and I think. We have to take some accountability for ourselves to begin to educate ourselves and get the right resources to be educated. Right. So that we can share the right information and not inaccurate information. So right. that, that, I think that's critical. And, and it's something that we should be doing anyway, mm -hmm. is to um, learn and study and be mindful Mm -hmm. of the information that people are giving you. Mm -hmm. Usually if people are saying things that are pretty strange, they probably are. Mm -hmm. Like humans with tails. <laughs> right. That like just, humans with tails. Just doesn't happen. <laughs> Ladies, this has been wonderful. We have been uh, honored with the presence of the Community of Health Center of Buffalo Leadership, the Honorable Dr. LeVon Ansari, and Dr. Kenyani Davis, our pre preventative medicine doctor and chief medical officer. Just a little bit about the Community Health Center. We are a foresight uh, organization offering uh, adult and pediatric medicine, dental, physical therapy, uh, and counseling. We're right here in the community. 986-9199 is the best way to contact us. Look us up online chcb.net. Thanks for watching this special program from the Community Health Center of Buffalo, your partner for quality care. For more information, please go to chcb.net or call the Community Health Center at 986-9199. The Community Health Center of Buffalo is responsible for the content and paid a production fee for the preceding presentation.